Hi, Year 10. I thought because we weren't having a lesson today that I just record something short, um, ideally something that will tie in with the home learning that you've done over the last couple of weeks um, on uh, life in Norman England, the, the Norman or Anglo-Saxon legal system and the rising against Earl Tostig. So we start with Edward the Confessor. Um, he was not in a strong position as king. He's quite a weak Anglo-Saxon king. Uh, he has been brought back um, as King of England by Godwin in 1042 after quite an extended period of Danish rule. If we look at the timeline below, we can see that um, Edward's nearest Saxon relative is Ethelred the Unready. Um, Ethelred Unred, uh, which doesn't really mean unready, uh, but that's the word we use as an English translation. He is uh, king of England and king of pretty much all of England when there is an invasion uh, by a Dane, a Danish king called Canute. Now, Canute takes control of the kingdom. Ethelred the Unready is killed um, and his son, uh, who will become Edward the Confessor, flees, runs away into exile in Normandy. Uh, Canute establishes himself as a successful king um, and even is able to pass the throne on to his son, Hartha Canute. And it's only when Hartha Canute dies um, in 1042 that Edward the Confessor has an opportunity to return. Now, he couldn't have done this without the help of Earl Godwin. Um, and Godwin is going to become a key part of the, of the start of Edward's story. So Edward was, to was totally dependent on the Godwin family for his power. He had agreed to marry Godwin's daughter, Edith, in return for Godwin's help becoming king. So Godwin is playing a long game. He could probably have made himself king if he'd so wished, but he sees a much more legitimate way of bringing his family to power. And that's not to try and seize the kingdom himself and uh, face potentially threats and invasions, um, but to marry his daughter to a rightful heir to the king, Edward the Confessor. So Edward the Confessor is brought back, married to Godwin's daughter, Edith, so that Godwin's grandchildren and great-grandchildren can all be kings of England. At least that is Godwin's plan uh, when he attempts um, to create this situation. Uh, Godwin and his family then take over every major earldom in the kingdom. Uh, Edward the Confessor does try and actually exile the Godwin family. He can obviously see that Godwin's put a lot of pressure and put him into a very difficult position. So in 1050, uh, Godwin, uh, Edward tries to get rid of Godwin and all of his family, with the exception of his wife, uh, Edith. He doesn't chuck Edith out, but the rest of the Godwin family are sent into exile. And Edward may well have asked his friends in Normandy for help in doing this, because that's where Edward had grown up, in, in Normandy in northern France. However, Godwin arrives at the head of a, a massive army and a fleet, an entire navy, a year later. And Edward uh, makes the decision to pardon Godwin rather than risk an invasion and potentially a blood-drenched civil war. England is also still quite a divided kingdom. I think Edward realises that he may well need Godwin's help if he is to unify the kingdoms. Um, Technically, Edward controlled everything from Hadrian's Wall, which the Romans had built to cut, cut off Scotland from England, to the Channel. Um, but there are significant differences between the north uh, and the east and the south and the west. And you can see that line running, the blue dotted line runs from the edge of Northumbria down through Essex to the edge of London. And this area directly above we call the Dane Law. Technically part of England, but in reality um, controlled by a series of um, local leaders, uh, most of whom have a Danish ancestry, Viking ancestry, and who hold these very difficult lands on the border with Scotland uh, and in the north and the east of England. So they, although they are technically one kingdom, they function much more like two very closely related but separate kingdoms. Now you can see these little red dots, these are burrs. These are where the Kingdom of Wessex has built fortified towns um, or fortified cities to defend itself from Danish incursion and Danish invasion into Wessex. They, the Anglo-Saxons built large fortified towns, uh, very different to the Normans' castles that we're familiar with. These had uh, usually a crossroad, so two streets met in the middle, uh, high wooden and occasionally stone walls. They'd have a church, uh, a manor house, 
They'd have um, some pasture, some farmland potentially inside them. They'd have a series of houses, shops, businesses. Uh, they are yeah, walled towns. And the idea would be that when the Danes attacked, when the Danes came in over the border of the Dane Lord into Wessex, uh, not only could the people who lived in these burrs um, shelter there, but actually lots of people from all of the surrounding areas could bring themselves, their families, uh, any goods, cattle, any silver or gold um, into these safe um, burrs and prevent, essentially starve the Danes out. The Danes would arrive, they'd find almost nothing of value uh, in the south part of England. Everything was safe in these burrs. The Danes don't like laying siege to them because they lose lots of men when they do that. And so they would go back across uh, our magical blue line into the Dane law and, and no longer be a threat. So on um, this week, we are going to focus on the kind of influence the Godwins have, which we've talked about a little bit, and then two major events, the first of which is Harold's embassy to Normandy. So we don't know very much for certain, but there are three facts. Edward sent Harold to Normandy in 1064 or maybe 1065 with a message. That is one thing that we know. Either those years, but he was sent with a message. We know that Harold was shipwrecked and taken prisoner by Guy of Ponthieu, but that William rescued him. Uh, Harold fought for William and William gave him gifts of weapons and armour. No one disagrees with those things. And the last one, Harold swore an oath as part of the embassy, but we don't know what that oath was. And you can see that oath here depicted in the Bayeux Tapestry. That's Harold standing between. And you can tell because of the longer hair at the back and the moustache. Um, and what he says matters because the Normans say that Harold swore allegiance to William and recognised William as the future king of England. Whereas the Anglo-Saxons say that the embassy was to recover two hostages who had been held to protect Edward, the confessor, from Godwin. So people, uh, Edward's family and friends who were in Normandy would have felt very worried that Godwin might bring Edward over um, to England, kill him, remove any other claim to the throne and then seize the throne himself. Um, and so Godwin would have been expected to leave uh, members of his own family as proof that he was going to keep his promise. This is a pretty standard medieval practice of leaving hostages. It works the same way as when you tell your teacher you're going to the toilet and they say, that's fine, but leave your mobile phone here. It guarantees that you'll come back. It's something that you're unlikely to break your promise and risk losing. So this leads on to our second major event. And these two are deeply related because Godwin and Godwin's family, because Godwin's dead by this point, uh, Godwin's family have taken control of most of England. And when Earl Seward, um, often known as Seward the Bear, Earl of Northumbria, died in 1055, his eldest living son uh, was only five years old. His name's Waltheof. Um, we're going to find out a bit more because he obviously grows up during this period and he's going to be important when we look at the rebellion of the earls uh, in about 10, 15 years time. So uh, Tostig had made uh, an important political marriage to Judith of Flanders. Tostig is, is Harold's brother, Harold's next oldest brother. Um, and he's married quite uh, well. He's married Judith of Flanders. Uh, Flanders is like modern day Belgium. So it's an important trading ally. Therefore, he was in a good position to demand to be promoted to Earl of Northumbria. There's no point appointing Waltheof because he's only a child. Um, so choose a new Earl and why not make it Tostig? He is a uh, Godwinson. He's a member of the family of Godwin. He's Harold's uh, younger brother. Um, Harold is the most powerful Earl in the kingdom. He's made this important marriage. Why not? However, Tostig went too far. Harsh new taxes, laws and political assassinations led to a rebellion against Tostig in 1065. Harold could have stopped this. Harold is the most powerful man in the kingdom, could have marched an army with the king's permission north, uh, killed anyone who disagreed with him and ensured that Tostig stayed in power. But he didn't. And this is important because these this matches, or this matches at least part of the argument the Anglo-Saxons give that Harold is collecting hostages um, because Edward no longer needs protecting and that Edward isn't going to live very long at this point and that Harold is going to be the next 
in line to the throne, not William. So Harold knew that Edward was not going to live much longer and Tostig was his next biggest rival. So to not help Tostig and for Tostig then to be um, sent away in exile, kicked out of the country for, um, after he loses his earldom, is perfect for Harold because that's one person he's not got to compete against if he wants to be king. Harold would have needed the support of the Witan. The Witan is the king's council and they choose the next king. A rebellion against Tostig was a chance to gain support from Earls Edwin and Morcar. And it's interesting that Morcar replaces Tostig as Earl of Northumbria. Edwin and Morcar are brothers. Edwin is Earl of Mercia. Uh, Morcar is Earl of Nothing until he is promoted to Earl of Northumbria. Harold also marries Edwin and Morcar's sister, um, confusingly also called Edith, though we call her Edith Swanneck. So... Harold had a lot to gain from getting rid of Tostig. It allows him to make a political marriage uh, with two other earls, uh, the earls of Mercia and Northumbria. It allows him to promote Morcar, uh, which is going to give him more favour, and that's going to potentially give him at least three votes in favour of him in the Witan, and probably a lot more, because these three men um, collectively control pretty much the middle of the kingdom. Uh, Edward Sorry, Harold controls the south and the west, Morcar controls the north and the east, and Edwin controls the middle. So this is where we're going to leave things for today. Uh, the next few lessons are going to focus on what happened when William actually died and the succession crisis. But I'm hoping you'll be able to either have these lessons in class or we'll run them live online. Thank you very much for listening. Have a great week.